Good evening. Several years ago, I was in a meeting in a small country congregation near the Tennessee uh, Kentucky border, and they had one light switch that governed all the lights in the auditorium. And I was doing a presentation, as I'm wont to do, using slides. And so the only way they could dim the lights was to turn them all off. <laughs> and so when they turned them off in preparation for my lesson, I made a remark something like this. The lights are off because you look better in the dark. <laughs> and then I continued very quickly by saying I also look better in the dark. But it was very interesting. I was standing off to the side. The screen was over here. And I could see the reflection of the screen in the whites of everybody's eyes. And everybody paid attention to what was going on. It was like I was the narrator and I wasn't even there. So it worked pretty well. Uh, let me tell you about the wonderful experiences we had so far this morning. <laughs> I went to the wrong church building before I got here. Did I tell you that? Yes, I did. I thought, oh boy, this is great. I'm on time. I walked in and I said, who do I give this thumb drive to? And they looked at me like, what planet are you from, buddy? <laughs> and we got here and Andy had some interesting uh, issues with the sound system. Uh, we found out later that the remote's batteries were in backwards. That's why it didn't work. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, it was very amusing. One of the ladies came up to me and saw me pick up a piece of pie and wanted to know if I wanted some whipped cream on it. I said, oh, sure, that'd be great. We have some in the refrigerator. I'll go get it. Well, it was almost empty. And when she turned it upside down, <laughs> whipped cream went everywhere. <clears throat> I may have some in my beard, so you'll have to take a closer look later. And then on top of that, Jean gets to introduce me tonight. So uh, things are going well. We're studying the book of Job this week. And in the context of studying the book of Job, our lesson this evening is focusing on Satan in the book of Job. Satan, of course, is introduced very early in the biblical record in the book of Genesis. We want to focus not just about what he does in the book of Job itself, but something about the names and the character and the wiles and or tricks of Satan as is depicted in Job and elsewhere. And then a, a contemporary application uh, that's still 2,000 years old, old but still has application to us today uh, from the closing verses of the book of Romans. Uh, so let's get started as we talk about the book of Job and Satan. Let's talk about his names. The Bible uses a number of different names and or descriptions for who Satan is and what Satan does. And we're not going to elaborate much on what they are. We're simply going to note them and move on so we could get a picture of, of who he is and what he does, and then we'll learn more about why he does what he does as we're going a little further. And the scriptures use in both the Old Testament and New Testament the names of Abad and Apollyon, one Hebrew, one Greek, both of them mean destroyer. Before we go any further, knowing that element about Satan's character, about his nature, tells us a lot. He's not a builder upper, he's a terror downer. And there are folks that are like that in the world, and sadly to say, there's some folks that are like that in the kingdom of God. Uh, God wants us to be engaged in edification, which means to build something up, that is to build something up spiritually. But Satan, under the guise of trying to help us do something that he says is better for us, is really tearing us down. And that's an important thing to understand as we go forward. He's also known as the accuser. He's always pointing, pointing his, his finger at somebody, passing the buck, uh, casting blame on others. He's known generally speaking as adversary. The name Satan itself means adversary, but sometimes he's called in our English translation as adversary. That's what he is depicted at in our reading a little bit ago, that he's an adversary, pacing back and forth, back and forth like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, the notion of being called an adversary means he's against us, but everything that he says, at least everything that he pretends to say, is allegedly, supposedly, in our best interest for us. And so what he presents himself as is something other than what he really is. And that notion of deception and lying and deceit is in everything that he does. He's referred to as an angel or as a messenger of sorts, but he's referred to as an angel that has fallen or and classified with others who have fallen. He's called an angel of the pit, for example, in the book of Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11. And certainly as an angel or a messenger, he has some tale to bear. But the tale that he brings is everything opposite of what God wants us to know, what God wants us to be. So we'll know that, notice that going forward. A couple of times in the context of the New Testament, uh, Jesus is accused uh, of being in league with or working in concert with Satan. And he, they said, that, well, you're doing the work of Beelzebub. Well, Beelzebub is an Aramaic uh, expression used in the Old Testament to refer to a pit 
particular god of the Philistines, namely one of the five great Philistine cities, Ekron, Baal Zebub means Lord of the Flies. And so it is another designation used to reflect who Satan was. He's awful, often referred to as Belial or Belial, depending on how you pronounce it, which simply means worthless or wicked, but he presents himself as being worthwhile. He's also called the devil, which simply means a false accuser and a slanderer, perhaps the more common name uh, for what we uh, know him to be identified as in the context of the scriptures. He's referred to in the guise of a dragon in the great cosmic scene that's presented in the opening verses of Revelation chapter 12. He's simply referred to as an enemy. He's referred to as being engaged in, part of, and, uh, and the leader of all those that are evil and unclean spirits, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. He's called a liar and the father of liars from the beginning in the book of John, starting in verse 31 of chapter 8 and going through that context. Also in that immediate context, he's called a murderer. Now, none of these things are very, very flattering to say the least, uh, but God paints the picture as it really is. This is what Satan is. In a number of different contexts, he's referred to as a prince, uh, but not in the sense that Christ, of course, is the prince of peace. He's referred to as the prince of the uh, heir, of the prince of this world, and so forth. And so his reign, his rule, his dominion uh, is over far less than what uh, God reigns over. And all of these things are allowed, by the way, by God. God has given him the right to do these things, and so his right to be in control of these things is delegated to him. So he doesn't have this by his very nature. It's something that God has allowed him to do in order to make this world the perfect veil of soul making, determining what we're going to be ultimately in eternity. So he is also the prince not only of the world, but also of demons, and in this context we see Beelzebub mentioned again. He's also the prince of the power of the air. He has control over things to some extent only within the limits of this physical world. He only has those limits as they are allowed by God. He's also referred to as the prince or the ruler of darkness, and again, prince or the god of this world. The name that's used in our lesson, uh, the book of Job and Satan, Satan simply means adversary. And so sometimes we'll see the name Satan, and sometimes we'll see the translation of the name Satan as adversary. He is depicted as being a serpent, uh, operating under the guise of the serpent. Again, noticing something about the issue of deceit that we see in the very beginning of the book, of the Bible, Genesis, and at the end of the book, in the book of Revelation. He's uh, described as being a tempter, always prompting us, encouraging us, deceiving us to do something that goes against the will of God. And sometimes he's simply referred to as the wicked one, and everything about him is engaged in wickedness. I want us to understand something about the nature of Satan as it relates to who God is and what we said God made man to be like. We noticed this this morning, and we don't want to rehash everything that we brought out, but the nature of God is such that God is rational, emotional, moral, that he has a will that's uniquely his own and that he behaves in concert with all these aspects of his will, consistent with his nature. He cannot deny himself, again, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. And as you read what the Bible teaches about mankind made in his image, Genesis 1, 25 through 27, that man is made with a body, soul, and spirit. The body goes back to the grave, the spirit returns to God, but the soul continues on. And these aspects of the nature of God are also aspects of our own soulful nature. And God desires that in every aspect that God has, he wants us to imitate him. He wants us to follow suit. He wants us to be rational, emotional, moral, volitional, and behave as he does. But Satan's against every last aspect of the nature of God and against every last aspect of us doing what God wants us to do. I remind you of the passage in the book of Luke in the 8th chapter, starting in verse 11, where it explains the parable of the soil and the seed and the sower. It says in verse 12 that the understanding of that passage is key to knowing this relationship, that the seed is the word of God. And it says in that context that Satan comes along and snatches the word of God away from the hearts of men because Satan knows that it produces faith and that faith ultimately leads to eternal life. That's the order that's presented in John's thematic development throughout the book of John. These things are written that you might believe and that believing you might have life. And so Satan understands that. That's why in the context of the book of Acts, Elamus, who is a, uh, a man who comes and interrupts the teaching of Paul uh, going against, uh, as he's trying to teach Sergius Paulus, he's blinded. And when Paul refers to him, he refers to him in terms that equates what he's doing with Satan. Why is that? Because he was challenging God by means of challenging Paul's teaching of Sergius Paulus on this occasion. 
And so Satan doesn't want you to think like God. He wants you to think the way he wants you to think. He doesn't want you to love what God loves. He wants you to hate what God loves and to love what God hates. He doesn't want you to have a sense of moral oughtness that's in sync with God and according to the will that God wants for you. He wants you to develop a sense of immorality or a sense of amorality, following after what he wants. He doesn't want your will to be submissive to that of God. He wants you to be rebellious against God. And this concept of rebellion is everywhere in the context of Scripture where Satan has had his hand in influencing man. And finally, he doesn't want you to act like God, at least not consistently anyway, or at all. So in all of the things that God stands for, that God wants for me, Satan is against. And so he's not just my adversary, he's also God's adversary. And so in the context of being in an adversarial role for God, he's also in an adversarial role for me. If he doesn't want what God wants, and God always wants what's best for me, then obviously he's not going to want what's best for me as well. Let's look at some of the principles that Satan brings to the fore in the context not only of the book of Job, but elsewhere. Satan often wants us to look only at those things that are immediate, those things that demand present tense uh, examination, present tense requirement of action, and to divert ourselves from things that might require more uh, detailed introspection. And so from that perspective, he's all about actions without consequences. Now, this is very big in the religious world in which we live and also in the world that's secular, not at all trying to be religious, in which people assume that you can engage in certain behavior, certain actions, and there are no moral consequences to what you do. In the book of Colossians, Paul warns the church at Colossae to be, uh, to be on the lookout for those who are involved in promoting vain philosophies and deceitful philosophies according to the principles or the rudiments of the world. This is one of the rudimentary principles of the world. You can do whatever you want and have no consequences. Uh, you can engage in all sorts of illicit sexual behavior and, and don't worry about it. We'll take care of that. You take this pill the day after and everything's fine. And if you happen to forget that, well, we'll take care of it anyway. And so the moral actions that you take, and they are moral or immoral, have no consequences from some people's perspective. Well, that's okay with Satan. And so he's always looking at the immediate. You want this? You want this now? Don't worry about what's going to happen uh, later. And so we do that financially, and we build ourselves an incredible pile of debt. We do that morally, and we build ourselves an incredible pile of guilt. And so Satan's okay with that. And so he's diverting your attention, causing you to look at things that are in his interest and not in your interest and not at all in God's interest. And so Satan's good at causing you to look in other places than where you ought to look. One of the things that we mentioned from the standpoint of his names, uh, about, about being a deceiver, about being an adversary or a destroyer, is that he always disguises things to present them as better than they really are. From this perspective, it, sin wears a mask. The passage in the book of Hebrews in the third chapter talks about the deceitfulness of sin. Not very many people will sell a lot of alcohol or tobacco or other illicit products if they presented them as they really are. If they presented a man puking his innards out, lying in his vomit in the middle of a, of a uh, gully or in the middle of a, off the side of a sidewalk in a pouring rain, uh, barely able to move and or breathe and, and blabbering like a fool, that's not going to sell a lot of cores, I don't think. Drink responsibly. But they don't show a picture of that guy. Use drugs responsibly. But they don't show you the woman with needle tracks on all of her arms. They don't only show you the woman who's in her early 40s, a woman that I've known, who had six kids, no husband, and couldn't think of anything but getting her next fix. Satan doesn't sell you that. Yeah, you can get high and it's going to feel good now, but what about after that? And what's it going to do you, to you tomorrow and the next day? And what if you spend the rest of your life like that? Her life wasn't long. Her children found her dead in her kitchen. But the guise of Satan is, this is going to be good for you. This is going to look good. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. This is what you want. And so Satan always disguises and always is deceptive about reality. One of the dangers of Satan's influence is causing people to create a world that's not at all like God's world. Not at all like the world where we really live. It's a world that's according to his dictates and his principles. And as a result, it's damning to our souls. And so God wants us to open our eyes and see the world as it really is. And so Satan says, look at this world. This is all you've got. Live now. You only live once and so forth. And so that aspect of focusing on what's good to my senses, my physical senses, that's all that matters. Don't worry about anything else. Focus on the things that are going to please you. Focus on riches. All of these things he's saying are good for you. And, and, and God's responsible for all the troubles in the world. And so all of this is deceptive to say the least. 
And there's no way we can take the time to look at the entirety of the biblical text and address these things. But let me just encourage you to pick up the book of Proverbs and start reading the first few chapters. As the wise man talks to his son, he warns him about the wiles of sexual temptation. You see that road? You know where that road goes? You know who lives at the end of that road? Don't even go down that road. And the woman is depicted as engaged in all sorts of deception. She makes herself look beautiful, and her husband's away on a trip, and he's going to be gone for a long time, and she sees all the foolish young men out her window just, you know, waiting for her to call. And Proverbs is very direct. Everything is pictured as if it's beautiful, but Proverbs says that's a role that leads to the destruction of your soul. God paints things as they really are. And so principles of Satan, look out for yourself. Uh, you need to do what's best for you. You don't need to do what's best for somebody else. That's what Satan tempted Eve with. You know, if God was really honest and fair, he would have told you that on the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be just like God. You'll know what God knows. Don't you want to know what God knows? Don't you want to be just like God? If you want to look out for yourself, then that's what you want to do. And she bought that bill of goods. She was deceived, and Adam went along with that. And so that desire, that selfish, prideful desire drives us. Sometimes we want what others want. We want what others have. And that desire to constantly keep up with the Smiths or the Joneses or the Davises or whatever it might be fuels us. It makes us work for things that are going to perish when this world perishes. And God knows that. Satan knows that our desire to be something other than what we are at any cost for our good rather than God's good can damn us. Cain had the ability to do what was right as did his brother. He had the same information as did his brother, but he chose to do other than that. But the Bible says he was jealous. He was envious of his brother. Israel was often jealous of her, of her neighbors. Uh, Malachi, the question is asked, well, why should we serve God? What do we get out of it? Look at all these people who aren't serving God, and look what they have. Why should I give to God as I've been prospered? Look at all that money I can keep. I could do something good with that money. I could, I could pay off my house. I could buy a better car. I could save for my children's education. There are lots of good things I can do if I only don't do what God wants me to do. And so being envious of other people or jealous of what we could do if we change the way we're living, that, that Satan's okay with that. Satan also casts doubt and challenges on the integrity of God. This is very big in the book of Job. God, worship him? You've got to be kidding. He's got to pay you to worship him. There's something deficient in a God who has to pay people to worship him. And there's something deficient in the people who worship a God who pays him to do so. And so Satan was not just casting aspersions at God. He was casting aspersions at, at Job as well. You don't want to do that. And so Satan's doing this all of the time in the context not only of Job's life, but throughout the biblical text and our lives uh, today. And so the Bible, of course, refers to Satan as a liar and the father of a liar, uh, father of liars, but he calls God a liar. Now that's pretty interesting that Satan, the father of liars, accused God of not telling the truth in this and other occasions. That's not all the case. He also denies that what's intrinsic to the very nature of God, worthy of worship, he says that's not the case. God has to pay people to do what he wants them to do because people won't do it of their own free will because they realize God's not worthy of worship. And so everybody's indicted in, in his scheme. Satan says, of course, as we mentioned, that God has to bribe people to worship him. So he casts doubt on God. He casts doubt on man. He casts doubt on what God says, and he discourages. Remember the uh, opposition to the rebuilders of the city of Jerusalem, Sanballat and Tobias? You know, if a fox runs on that wall, it's going to fall down. How many times have people mocked you for what you do in the course of your service to God in Christ? Why would you show up at that building all those hours a week? That's too much. I had a young lady visit with us not too long ago who was a, a daughter of a friend that we knew in the greater Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area. And we've always tried to encourage her, always tried to teach her. And she said, you people are just too religious. You know, it takes up too much of your time. Well, her perception is, my time's mine. Not really. My body's not my own, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. My time's not my own either. It's God's. And so God wants me to use it for his honor and glory, but, but Satan challenges that sort of thing. So he lies and challenging, says, well, God says you're going to die if you eat this tree, but you're really not going to die. In the day that they began to eat, there's a process of separation that took place in a, multiple, a multiplicity of ways. And so there was really a separation from God, as Isaiah 59 chapter, uh, 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 verses 1 and 2 says. He also changes what God says. He changes the nature of God. 
changes the truth of God into a lie and causes people to live however they want to live. And so Satan does all of these things. He says, you, you don't have to do this. Uh, you can't do this anyway. And we see many examples of that in the context of the scripture. He, he pulls away from God's uh, request saying you need to do this. He said, no, that's too much. Well, you, that God's, God's demands of you are too high. Jeroboam literally said it's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. It's too far. Never mind the fact that they've been doing it before. You don't need to do this. Uh, you can do less, or you can even add more and make, uh, uh, make uh, greater laws than what God has said and escalate yours over God's laws, and Satan's involved in all of that. He also challenges our own character and our own ability, which fosters our, our failure before God. I, I can't really be what God wants me to be. Really? God said you can. God said you can. God's never asked anybody in any place, any time, under any set of circumstances to do other than what he knows you have the ability to do. The problem is we don't see it, therefore we don't want to do it. The children of Israel had the ability to go up and take the land of Canaan initially when it came up in the book of Numbers. But they failed to do so not because they couldn't, but they didn't realize that God was going to be with them. And when God promised they could do it, they didn't believe in God's promise. And so it was an issue of their lack of faith in the faithfulness of God. But God said you could do it. And so sometimes we think, I, I really can't know God. I really can't understand God. I really can't please God. But God said you can know him. God says you can understand him. God says you can please him. So who are you going to believe? Satan says you can't do it. God says you can. You toss a coin to make a decision? No. God wants you to come down on his side of the equation. And so Satan's got a better way for you. You can't do what God wants you to do. I can show you a better, easier, a simpler way, and you're going to feel good about it. Don't worry about all that guilt and consequences of sin stuff. Uh, just feel good about things. And there's a lot of pop psychology and even official psychology that allows people uh, to be dissuaded of, uh, of, uh, of guilt as an effective motivator to do what's right. So he challenges God. He challenges God's righteousness. He challenges God's standards. He challenges our own character. And so he challenges all the principles that God wants us to follow. And so he says, you don't, you don't have to follow this. You don't have to be holy. You can be reprobate and debased from God's perspective, and you can still be all right. You can lower the standards, and you can be all right. Lots of scandals going on in different educational entities around the country. There's a huge one in Atlanta. I was down in that area not too long ago, uh, staying with Evelyn's uh, cousin and, her, and his wife. Uh, there's a huge scandal in which teachers were fudging grades in order to make their students look better than they were so that they could get merit pay raises, and it was all a sham. Well, we're not talking about students getting better grades. We're talking about souls before a most holy God. We're saying, you know, you really don't have to do that. God's going to lower the standards a little bit, and you're going to look a whole lot better once we lower the standards. Paul warns the Corinthians about judging themselves by themselves in the latter part of the first epistle. Uh, and so we don't want to do that, not in order to be what God wants. We begin a toleration of sin in ourselves, and we see sin in our own lives, and we think that's okay. God knows my heart, God knows I'm weak, God, God, God knows my frame that I'm made of dust. The psalmist even said that, so God knows I'm going to sin. Well, that's true, he does. But that's not an excuse to live in sin. And so as we consider these things, going on to the next point, toleration of sin in others, indigenous sins. I remember a number of years ago, a brother in Christ was involved in a practice that I thought he ought to consider. He says, it's legal. I said, what's your point? He says, if it's legal, it's moral. I said, really? If it's legal, it's moral? It's legal to take the life of unborn children in this country. It has been for a long time. Is that moral? Oh, I don't believe that. It's legal in certain parts of the country to be engaged in, in, uh, in uh, running houses of prostitution. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. My understanding is there are a lot of people in Lynchburg, uh, Tennessee, where Jack Daniels is made, wouldn't drink a drop, but don't mind working there. Indigenous sins. I remember in Florida a number of years ago talking to a brother that we met on a campaign and concerned about the scantily clad people, men and women, running around the streets, going, you know, shopping. He said, this is Florida. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> that excuses it. Indigenous sins. Well, Satan says, that's okay. Don't worry about those things. And so God challenges, excuse me, Satan challenges God's principles as standards of righteousness all the time. He alluded to this in Isaiah 5 and verse 20 earlier that some people call good evil and evil good and reordering the importance of God's commands. You don't have to do things in this order. You can do something in another order. I know a young lady that when she realized she needed to become a Christian and understood the process by which she did, says, I want to be immersed in Christ for the remission of my sins. So as we studied with her a little bit longer, we found out that she was living with a man. 
and said, uh, well, you, you can't do that if you're going to continue to live with this man. But I know I need to be baptized. You do. But you can't be baptized where you're living with this man. And so he constantly tried to teach her. Sometime later, she went and found somebody who would baptize her. I don't know whether or not she told uh, her circumstances, but she came uh, to members of the congregation and says, I've been baptized. Well, good, that means you're not living with so-and-so anymore. Oh, she said, oh, I still am. What? Wait a minute. Repentance has to precede this. I repented of almost everything, she said, but not that relationship. Now, later she married the man, and she's convinced she's okay. Did things totally out of order. She says, I got rid of this sin, but a long time after I became a member of the body of Christ. What's wrong with that? It's reordering what God has said is a matter of priority, logical, chronological, and moral in this context. Satan also argues that uh, how you live is not important. You can do whatever you want to do. As long as your heart's right, as long as your attitude is right, and this is a false understanding of the concept that's brought out in Hosea and the Gospels about mercy and not sacrifice, doesn't that mean God just cares about my heart? Doesn't that mean that God's not really concerned about faithful obedience? Not at all. And so Satan argues that correct beliefs don't matter, and Satan argues that correct practices don't matter. Good people suffer, so why should you suffer? Just go ahead and do what you want to do and get what you want. That's okay. And so Satan is driven. He's driven to do all of these things for a reason. What does he get out of it? What does he get out of it? Well, he's jealous. He wants to be in the place of God, as we're about to see. He's, uh, he's filled with pride. The qualifications of elder says that an elder should not be a novice lest he fall into the same condemnation that Satan fell into. And that's the issue of wanting more sooner than you should be able to, uh, to get it in the context of serving as elders. But Satan wanting more than was allowed to him. It's like the man who wanted to buy the right to lay hands on people and give gifts as did the apostles in the book of Acts in the 8th chapter. That's not yours. That's not your lot. You need to pray that your heart's going to be forgiven you. And he realized he'd done wrong, but he wanted something that was not appropriately his. But Satan's okay with that. Satan wants to be worshipped. But it's not just that Satan wants to be worshipped as if he wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped not just by man, but also by God. He wants to swap roles. He compelled, or tried to anyway, to get Jesus to bow down and worship him and said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. And so it's not just that Satan wants to thwart God. He doesn't just want to throw a monkey uh, wrench into the works. He wants to stop God from being God, and he wants to be God in his stead. And so from that perspective, he's trying to do everything that he possibly can to stop what God has started or to interrupt what God has started. Now, I want us to look at the closing verses of Romans chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go there. Because I want, us, want you to see a list of sins that are addressed. And we don't have time to look at all of them individually. But I want you to see a list of sins in which when people give themselves over to Satan, they are characterized by the terms uh, that are used in this and other passages. And it's a lengthy list, but we're only going to look at a few of them. The first thing that's brought out, and this is going to vary depending on the translations that you might use, but the first one that's brought out in the context of this passage is Romans chapter 1 and verse 28, where it says that God gave them over to a reprobate or a debased mind. Now that word is a very unique word that's translated as reprobate or debased, and here's what it means. There's a passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21 that says, test all things, hold fast to what's good. Similar to the passage we see in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 where it says, Brethren, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are they of God. The word test in each of these instances means to test to make sure something passes muster, to make sure that it is what it claims to be, that it's been approved, that it's been demonstrated to be effective in whatever purpose that was under consideration in the context. What's interesting in this passage, in this context, you have the exact opposite of that. You know what happens when you put an A on the front of the word theist, you get the opposite of a theist, you get an atheist. Well, that's what happens here. The Greek language puts an A on the front of this passing the test word, dokimos, and says adokimos, which means not standing, not passing the test. Now, that's very serious. Now, here's the significance of that. God has expectations for me. God has a test, so to speak, and I don't mean that we're graded, so to speak, on a, on a regular test in school and that sort of thing, and I'm not trying to make this an overly legalistic thing, but this is the principle that's brought out in this context. God has expectations of you, and he has expectations of me. 
and he knows what my limits are, and he knows what I, my ability uh, is and my abilities are to, to live up to or to fall short of those expectations. And so God's going to judge me based upon my abilities and whether or not I meet up to my abilities. One of the worst things that I heard when I was in high school was this, Jody, you have potential. You know what that meant, don't you? You're not doing what you could do. God looks at us and says, you have potential. You can be better than you are. And so these people aren't holding up their end of the bargain. They're not being what God wants them to be. Satan's okay with that. Satan's okay with that. Now the next expression that's used in this uh, context, it talks about people that they're engaged in things uh, that are not fitting. It says those things that are not fitting, those things that are not appropriate. Now that's an incredible expression. It means that they lowered standards, similar to what we mentioned before in the academic world. Hey, everybody wants to get an A. All we got to do is drop the grading scale. And if we drop the grading scale, everybody's going to look smarter than they really are. Only in God's scale, we're not talking about grades and academic achievement. We're talking about matters of holiness and righteousness. Let's just drop all these requirements of that about marriage and divorce. Let's just drop all these requirements about, uh, about what you do to your physical body. Let's drop all these requirements about uh, for, uh, forbidding and, and prohibiting illicit relationships. Let's just drop all of those, and everybody's holy all of a sudden. Wow, that sounds good to me. Well, Satan's okay with that. And here's what's interesting. Paul is writing about all of these sins to saints in Rome, Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. Why? Because this is where they lived. This is what's going on around them. This is what's going on as Christianity confronts culture in the city of Rome 2,000 years ago. And so the same sins that they're warned about in this context, we're warned about. Why? I don't want to be like that. That's exactly right. You don't. But Satan is selling a bill of goods that says, if you're like this, yeah, God may say you're not right in his sight, but that's okay with me. And so Satan's challenge to us is not to be what God wants you to be. So we see a number of these passages. We're not going to look at all of them. We're going to quickly go through some of them, filled with unrighteousness, engaged in sexual immorality, being involved in wickedness. I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen. Uh, that all came out as red, it looks like. But there's a superscript by some of the words, the Greek terms that are there, and there's a number there. And that number represents the number of times that that particular word appears in the Greek text throughout the New Testament. And the significance of that is going to become more apparent, more uh, 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 transparent as we go a little bit further. Sometimes God is using words in this context that he uses nowhere else in the Bible and repeatedly. You have a series of words that appear nowhere else in the Bible. It's like God has an extreme list of sins uh, and a, a terms to qualify the sins that are going on in the, in the lives of these people in and around the Roman Empire, especially the city of Rome, that he wants to make sure people grasp the gravity of them by using language that's not used anywhere else or almost nowhere else. And so he's talking about people that are involved in all these wicked things. They're involved in maliciousness and evil. They're filled with envy. They're engaged in murder. They're involved in strife and deceit, which is one of Satan's strongholds, are involved in evil-mindedness. Now, this is an incredible term. This term used nowhere else in the context of the scriptures means they're doing evil not just because they're going to get something out of it, but because they just want to do evil. One of my readings through the Bible a number of years ago, I paid special attention to expressions about people's love for sin and love for what's wrong. The book of Micah talks about people who go to bed at night dreaming of all the evil that they can do the next day and can't wait to get up the next morning because they have the power and the ability to set forth in motion all those things that accomplish the evil they dreamed about before. It talks about people wrapping their arms around evil with both hands and not letting go. Some people just love things that are bad for them. Well, God's warning us about that desire and warning that some of us may shift off a little bit into that. We're going to see at the very end of this list, some people may not be engaged in all these practices, but they don't mind observing and taking a little bit of pleasure in those who are. And we need to be concerned about that. Notice the language again that's used in this context, the whispers, the backbiters. Notice these are terms that are used nowhere else in the context of the scripture. Unique term that's used in this passage is that these people are haters of God. These aren't people who just, well, I'd rather not be bothered with your religious beliefs. No, thank you, sir or ma'am. But they hate God. God gets in their way. 
A number of years ago, a brother was lecturing in the context of uh, presenting arguments for the existence of God and all those things that went with it in a college auditorium. And a student stood up and spoke. He says, it's not that we don't understand what you're saying. It's not that we don't understand the evidence leads to God. We understand all that. But if we believe that, it demands that we live differently. And we don't want to live differently. Bingo. Yes. Right. It's not rational things that keep us from being what God wants us to be. It's, it's our will. It's our love for sin. It's our emotions. It's our desire to do for self rather than do for God. And so that's what these people are involved in. These people are violent. They're insolent. They're proudful. They're full of themselves. They're boasters of themselves. They're inventors of evil things. There's a passage or two in the context of the book of Jeremiah where God uses a hyperbolic expression where he says, I didn't even imagine the horrible things that you're involved in. Now, that doesn't mean God's not aware of things before they're happening. He knows the end before the beginning. But he uses that expression just to show how far and how wicked people can be in engaging behavior that's totally opposite of what God wants. Just pick up your papers. Just read. It goes on here. It goes on everywhere in this country. It goes on everywhere around the world. Or people involved in horrible wickedness, humanity, inhumane things against other human beings as well as against God. Now here's what's interesting in the next series of terms that appear. It's this word that God wants in passing the test that we saw in the very beginning. And it's that word with the uh, Greek letter A in front of it, which means you're everything opposite of that. So it says you're disobedient, which means God wants you to be obedient, but you're rebellious. And so you have the opposite of what God wants you to be. Rather than being discerning, you're undiscerning, the opposite of what God wants you to be. Rather than being trustworthy and filled with faith, you're untrustworthy, the opposite of what God wants you to be. In all of these, there are six or seven of them in a row, God says you're the exact opposite of where I want you to be. Satan's okay with that. Satan's okay with that. He's all right with you giving up on God. He's all right with you giving up on God's truth and living a life that's consistent with the way you want to live, regardless of what God says. They're unloving, without natural affection. They're unforgiving, continuing the list of things that they're the exact opposite of. God wants you to demonstrate mercy, and you're not like that at all. What's sad in this context, it says these people, Romans chapter 1, verses 18, and towards the end of the passage where we are now, it says you should know better than that. We should know better than that. That there is within us an element of conscience, eternity that's ingrained in our hearts, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, that shows us we shouldn't be this way. But you can harden your hearts and you can harden your conscience. And what might be something that you used to know by matter of practice and by matter of repetition, you can become something totally opposite of what God wants you to be. That's what's going on in the lives of these people. And Satan is okay with that. It's not just talking about believing these things, but practicing these things. It says they're deserving of death. That's hard to read, where people can be so far removed from God that nothing touches their heart or their conscience anymore. First Timothy chapter 4, the opening verses talks about that. That's where these people are. Satan's okay with that. Can't be touched by God? Good deal. I got that person forever on my side. And so Satan is trying to get Job that God knows is a righteous man, that God knows is one who fears him, that God knows is one who stays away from evil, upright, and nobody else like him on the planet. Three times God says that about him. Satan's willing to use him to get back at God and to make shipwreck of his faith, as we see Paul saying of others in the context of the New Testament. And he's okay with that. Why? He gets what he wants. Don't be a tool in Satan's ploy to work against God. And you make that determination whether or not you're going to be. Now this passage talks about people who are engaged in behavior similar to what these people are engaged in and playing along with Satan's ploys and Satan's tools. But not just those who are doing the same thing, but who are approving of those who practice them. There's a lot of sin going on in the world. We vote about it. We pass bills to allow things that God doesn't want. And what do we do? Oh well, doesn't affect me. I'll live another day until it comes home till it affects us personally. We are so tolerant of things that are wrong, we become accepting of those things that are wrong, we become approving of those things that are wrong, and slowly but surely, we're gonna be dragged into doing those things that are wrong. It's just a process of giving up little by little. But God wants us to grow in our faith, not to lose our faith. Satan, has some incredible language that is used about him in 
in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want you to turn there and we'll stop after this passage. Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He had a lot of issues with the church at Corinth in the first epistle. But he has a different tone, a much more conciliatory tone as he writes the second epistle. And he's concerned about them. The brother that was involved in wickedness and sin is repented. And he's encouraged to take them back. And he says something that's very powerful in the opening verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. This may seem a little foolish to you, but just hold on. I, I want to say this. And he says, indeed, you do bear with me. I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. What are you talking about, Paul? Paul says, I have betrothed you to one husband. Spiritually speaking, he's presented them to Christ, caused them to be part of the bride of Christ. I've done this so that you might be presented as a chaste version to Christ. And then he goes on. Knowing what he has done and laboring amongst the Corinthians, being involved in the establishment of the church, the Corinthians hearing believe were baptized, Acts chapter 18, verse 8, working to resolve those problems in the first epistle. He says, after all of that, I'm concerned, I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve. That's Satan. What did he do? He deceived Eve. He deceived Eve by his craftiness. He didn't come out right and say, I'm, I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you something that's totally opposite of what God wants. No, he didn't do that at all. But the effect was there. The impact was there. She was deceived. He was crafty. So that your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity in Christ. I don't want you to lose that. The term simplicity there is powerful. It means single-mindedness of purpose, single-mindedness of will. It means that you're so resolute in your faithfulness to God that you would never turn aside to the left or the right, stop or retreat or go backwards or just give up on your faith. But Paul knows that even though these people were grounded in the faith by means of the gospel, you heard it, you believed it, you received it, as long as you stand in it, you'll be saved by it, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Talking to the same people, he still was afraid that some of them could still be pulled away by Satan. As long as you live, Satan will be what we read about at the beginning. Roaring lion, pacing back and forth, seeking whom he may devour. If you're not a Christian, Satan doesn't want you to become one. You don't have to become one. If you want to be pleasing to yourself and Satan, that's okay. If you want to be pleasing to God, God wants you to uh, take a step outside of your comfort zone. Find out what he really wants you to do and what he wants you to be. To come to faith in him, Hebrews 11, 6. Come to faith in the Christ, John chapter 8 and verse 24. Understand the authority, the integrity of the scriptures, John 17, verse 17. Understanding that they are truth. And know that by means of your obedience to the truth, obedience to the faith, obedience to the gospel, surrendering your will to his will, that you can stand against the wiles of Satan. We haven't focused on that as much. More about that tomorrow. But the Bible says, resist the devil, James chapter 4, and he will flee from you. These people, members of the body of Christ in the church at Corinth, were presented to Christ as a pure, chaste virgin. And Paul was concerned that Satan would not give up even after they started down the road of faith and faithfulness. He said, you could still be deceived, as was Eve. I don't want you to lose that single-mindedness of purpose. That's what God wants you to have if you're not a member of the body of Christ. To be so resolute in your faithfulness that nothing else matters. Not your life, not your health, not your possessions, not anything but service to God in Christ. That's what God calls you to do and calls you to be. And you can do it with God's help and the help of brothers and sisters in Christ and the promises of the Bible and the prayers that God wants you to have uh, on, on your behalf towards God. You can do that. We encourage you to be a member of the body of Christ by being immersed in Christ even this evening. And those of us who are Christians, I remind you that those list of sins that were recorded in verses 28 and following of, of Romans were written to the church. It wasn't written to the world. Paul was warning the church about everything that's around them. We could go through that same list and say, yes, I see that today, not far from here, in my own neighborhood, in fact, in my own backyard, in my own family, in my own life. God wants you to be prepared. He knows that Satan's vigilance is such that he never, ever yields until the end of time in which he's going to be permanently restrained. But until then, he wants you, and so does God. The choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.